Okay, thank you, thank you for the warm welcome. And I'm really excited to be with uh, all of you today. So as already discussed, I think we can get into our topic right away. So today we'll be discussing about a career in the semiconductor industry. As all of you know, this is a very, uh, very important industry in the tech world. So let me start my screen share. Please let me know when you can see. Ah, sir, visible. Is it visible? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, as already mentioned, the importance of this industry needs no explanation. It needs no introduction. So all of you are very well aware of the importance of this industry. And so uh, as a member of this industry, as someone who's working in this in industry, I'm very happy to share my, in, uh, my knowledge and my information with all of you. Because uh, I think that this industry, the awareness about this industry is a little less among uh, students in Kerala. Because this industry is not uh, there much in Kerala. So I'm happy to be with all of you. Before we start the session, let me just uh, tell a few points. So first thing is that uh, this is going to be an informal session. Don't consider it like a lecture. You can ask questions, you can raise your comments, you can ask your doubts anytime. So please feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions or clarifications or whatever necessary. Uh, I'll be most happy to uh, so clear them for you. Uh, one more thing, I just want to know uh, which all branches are here, which all, uh, all, I just wanted to understand your backgrounds. So all the EC students, can you give a thumbs up? Can you give a hi or something? Can you just type something up? In the chat, I mean. You can do a raise hand, you can do something on the EC student. Okay, I see one hand. Okay, two, three, four. Okay. Good, good. I think there are quite a number of EC students. That's really good. Now, uh, the triple E student, any triple E student? Okay, okay. Maybe it's better if you can type in your branch name. The other branches, CS. All of you. Is there anyone from CS? Okay, I see one person. Okay, two. Okay. Any instrumentation? Electronics and instrumentation? Anyone? Okay, I don't see any AI yet. Okay, any other branches? Any other branches like civil, mech? Oh, okay, we have a civil person. Okay, we, uh, we have an ME, so I imagine that is mechanical. Anything else? Okay, I see an AI and DS. I don't really understand what it is. Fine. So yeah, civil is there. And I see. Yeah, someone wants to say something. Okay, artificial intelligence and data science. Okay, that's that's grand. Very good. Okay, okay. Fine. I just wanted to know the background of all of you who are attending. Don't worry. I'm not going to make it too technical. I'll be talking in very simple terms so that uh, everyone, even someone who's not familiar with this industry will understand. So that is my goal today. So I hope all of you get something from this session. So uh, I'm telling you once again, please feel free to ask questions, uh, raise doubts. Uh, you are free to interrupt me. So please uh, do that if you have any doubts. So let's go forward. As already mentioned, uh, my details are already mentioned, but just for the sake of um, just, just a brief introduction from my side, I've been uh, associate design engineer for the past uh, three plus years and I've been an IEEE volunteer for eight plus years. I have served in various roles in my student branch and in uh, actually Kerala section and 
in India Council. So that's about me. So now let's go into the industry that uh, the topic that we are all waiting for, the semiconductor industry. So to give a very brief intro to this industry, I, I'll show you two pictures. So, so this is the first one. Can anyone identify what this is? The circuit branches, to please, ECs, or someone else, can someone unmute and say what this is? Transistor. Uh, it is not a transistor. Can you can you can you guys see the what a part a name? Capacitor. Capacitor. No, no, it's not a capacitor. MOSFET. Voltage no, regulator. Regulator. Yes. Yes. Voltage yes. regulator. Yes, yes, yes. Whoever said that? That's correct. Yeah. Who who said that? I heard two, from two people. Okay, yeah, over it is. So, so this is a this is a voltage regulator IC which is packed into a semiconductor or which is packed as an IC. So basically, it is uh, this one. This particular one is seven eight zero five, and it's uh, it's basically a uh, some. It is a device which uh, stabilizes your voltage at five volts. If you give a range of voltage from say three to forty volts DC, I'm saying, so it will. Uh, stabilize that voltage at uh, five volts. So that is the basic idea behind this, uh, this chip, we can say. Now I'll show you another picture. Okay. So I don't think anyone will recognize this, but is there anyone, is there anyone who knows what this is? C on CPU, X86 C on CPU. Uh, can you identify which which version this is? Which which generation this is? No. Okay, no, no, no issues because this is the latest generation of uh, Intel's Xeon um, this Xeon scalable server chips, server SOC. So these are the two extremes. I, I, the one on your left, you can see that that is one of the most simplest semiconductor device out there. It has it has like hardly 20 odd transistors inside and some and many res resistors, few capacitors. That's basically it. And on your right, you see the other extreme. Uh, that is the Intel's latest server processor, which holds, uh, I don't know the correct number, but upwards of 10 billion transistors. And that is the most advanced server till now, at least from Intel. So. These are the two extremes of this industry. It can be anything as simple as a voltage regulator to as complex as a server SOC, or even uh, there are even more complex AI accelerator chips and very specific uh, chips out there. So I just wanted to give you a, 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 so how much vast this industry is, how much uh, and how much important this industry is. Everything from a small toy that we use and any toy that we uh, we used to play as kids, you know, our remote control cars or from those things to space shuttles and Mars rovers utilize the power of semiconductor devices, semiconductor ICs for its functional. So you can imagine how was this industry is. Now, I don't want to go too much into all those details, all those, uh, I, I don't want to praise the industry too much. Let's go into, uh, there are different types of companies in this space. So in this uh, semiconductor industry, there are uh, basically five types of companies that, uh, uh, which are divided based on the type of work that they do. Yes, anyone have any doubts? Okay. Yeah, so there are basically five types. I'll just give you a brief about that. So the first uh, first type of industry are called the designers. These are the people who design and uh, they design the chips that we use. For example, Qualcomm or ARM or MediaTek. So Qualcomm, as you all know, it designs the SOCs that powers most of our Android phones. So there are a lot of companies like that. And why they are called designers or why they are termed as designers is because they design the IC, but they don't 
manufacture it because they don't have the facility to manufacture it. So that is the second category of industries here, which are called as fabs. Uh, so a fab is where the the silicon or the semiconductor chip is actually manufactured. So there are very specific companies who uh, whose main job is only to manufacture these uh, semiconductor devices. They don't design their own uh, ICs, they manufacture. So companies like Global Foundries or TSMC, you know, all, all of Qualcomm's, AMD's, uh, NVIDIA's chips, most of their chips are made by uh, TSMC. Then there are other players like uh, Global Foundries and there are some uh, other companies in this place. So they are mostly focused on the manufacturing part, not the designing part. The third one are the hybrids who does both design and manufacturing. The companies like Intel or Texas Instruments. So they have their own design and they manufacture on their own most of the time. But even then, even these companies, uh, say for example, if Intel wants to uh, manufacture uh, its chip in another fab, say for example, in TSMC, they can do so. And in fact, it actually does. Some products, some Intel products are actually manufactured uh, in TSMC. So likewise, but uh, these are the companies which have both the capability. Now, another category, the fourth category of companies are the supports. So why I call them supports is because these the, they do a support function for these other companies, both the designers and the fabs. So this is com companies like um, Xilinx or companies like Synopsys. So they develop the tool, they develop the software, they develop the uh, all the support structure, which is utilized by other companies to uh, design and manufacture uh, these uh, semiconductor chips. So if you talk about uh, Synopsys, Synopsys is a very major player here. They have a suite of uh, software tools which are used for uh, design and manufacturing, all those things uh, in other companies also. So those are the supports. And then uh, last but not the least, we have the companies called services, which actually uh, does the design for other companies. They may not have their own product, but they provide design services for other parties. So if I go to one of these services company and I say, so I want a chip that has so-and-so specification. So these people, they will build it or they will do, uh, or they can even do services for the uh, other corporate companies. So for example, Intel needs uh, one of its chips to be tested. These companies can do that. So uh, I'll explain more as we go along, but this is just to give you a overview about the industry. Okay, moving forward. Uh, it is essential that before we go into the job aspects, the career aspects of this industry, it is essential that you should know some technical jargon. I know it might be a little dry, it might be a little, uh, it might be a little boring, but just bear with me for five minutes. This needs to be done because if you don't understand it going forward, uh, it will be difficult. So let's go. Uh, so these are some of the jargons. I'll explain each one as we go. So the first one is obviously integrated circuits, which I don't think there is any need for uh, an explanation. I think it's better if I show you in a picture. So this is a, this is a circuit board. This is a PCB. And you can see that there are several integrated circuits uh, in this PCB. So can you guys see? Yeah. So if you look at it, you can see that this one PCB has multiple integrated circuits. Uh, I hope uh, this is clear. I don't think there is need for any uh, more explanation. Basically, these are the chips that we are talking about with that this industry is mainly built around. Okay, the second one I want to share is uh, something called as a wafer. So a wafer is basically a giant uh, disc, uh, a disc of semiconductor material on which these uh, semiconductor chips are manufactured. So if you look at it, you can see wafers of different uh, sizes. And uh, if you look at it closely, you can see that 
you can see each individual chips which i'll come to in the next one that is die so each individual chips so this whole uh, this whole uh, uh, this wafer it has lot many dies in so you, you can see each individual square or rectangle is one die and uh, all of these could be the same uh, device or a different device so that depends on the manufacturer so this is uh, wafer and die and then next we come to another thing called package so a package is uh, as you saw the die is the actual a silicon chip which works that is the base layer of silicon you can say but that alone won't be of any use for that to actually work it needs to have multiple layers of uh, other materials like it should have uh, insulating materials then it should have these if you look at it you can see that uh, it needs to have these legs on it so that it can uh, have input output with the outside world so all these things together and the outer covering the protective covering together is called the package you can consider that what we refer as package and ic are almost the same thing okay so that is about it and yeah we have few more uh, we have few more terms which is used very much in this industry so let's just quickly go over that so the first one is ip one second yeah the first one is ip which is called as intellectual property so this is both a legal term and a technical term in legal term it means any kind of a technology whether it's software hardware design anything that is owned by an entity it can be a company it can be an individual so basically any uh, idea of mine can be considered as an ip but when we come to this particular industry we can say that ips are the the subsystems the various subsystems within uh, an ic various subsystems which makes up an ic uh, as we go uh, more we will understand more now another very important term is instruction set architecture so this is a basic uh, architectural definition of any kind of an ic uh when i say ic this applies more to digital ics so if uh, for an example i can say that there are mainly two architectures in the semiconductor world one is the x86 architecture which is developed by intel and it is used by intel and it is uh, used by amd basically what this means is it refers to the set of instructions the set of uh, op codes that an ic can understand so uh, a core i5 ic from intel understands the x86 architecture it won't understand the uh, arm architecture if i write a code in arm architecture uh, an x86 ip won't understand or vice versa so basically this you can consider it as the basic architecture of a ic okay next uh, one is hardware descriptive language or hdl so these are very specific programming languages which are used to write or which are used to design ics especially uh, these are used to design digital ics so some examples would be uh, so uh, verilog system verilog vhdl all those things so this language is uh, made in such a way that you can define various components of an ic through this language so various when i say various components of an ic what i mean is uh, gates registers transistors like that so it is made specifically for that purpose and also for the purpose of testing out these ics okay moving forward so we have something called as eda electronic design automation so these are the set of tools which are used to uh, design and uh, test uh, and do all sort of things in the semiconductor industry so if you remember i told about the supports the type of companies which supports other companies uh, with tools so these are the tools uh, it is commonly referred to as eda or electronic design automation why this is required is because 
today's integrated circuits are very complex things as i mentioned before the intel uh, that core uh, the server cpu that i showed it has upwards of 10 billion transistors so 10 billion transistors it is impossible for anyone to code it by hand so that's where we require this design automation okay so moving on so next is soc so if you noticed when uh, when they gave the introduction about me they told that i am a uh, soc design engineer so basically an soc is a system on chip uh, it means that lot of systems lot of different systems which were different different uh, i would say different different components is shrink together in a single ic uh, so uh, our phones uh, processes our phones socs are the best example our phone uh, a qualcomm snapdragon soc can have uh, cores it can have uh, memories it can have uh, io devices all things together in one single package and such a system is called as soc okay the next one is a register transfer level so this is a design methodology so it is a design abstraction you don't need to understand more uh, right now i'm just going forward so maybe uh, you can uh, note down these terms and you can uh, google for more info i don't have time to explain everything that's why i'm going a bit fast so basically it's a design abstraction this is uh, rtls how we design digital uh, ic's using the hdl languages Okay, so another thing is FPGA or Field Programmable Gate Array. So this is one type of uh, integrated circuit. This is one particular category. So usually uh, if you take the example of a microcontroller or a microprocessor, the design of that, the internal logic of that is fixed. We cannot change it. Once it is manufactured, it is fixed. We cannot go and change it. But FPGAs are configurable. So basically, you can consider them as arrays of gates, arrays of different gates. It can be XOR, or XNOR, or uh, there are different architectures. And we are able to uh, connect these gates, connect each of these gates to another gate as we desire through software program. So I, I know that it might be a little bit, uh, it, it might not, you might not understand it much. But just understand that this is a configurable uh, type of ICs where I can change the internal design many times using software. Okay, so any doubts in this? I know I went a little bit fast, but already we are uh, we have lost some time. So yeah, uh, anyone needs any explanations here? Okay. I don't think so. Okay, let's go to the next part. So next I want to just take you, uh, give you a brief overview of what's inside an IC. Again, this is also important uh, because without this, any doubt? Okay. Yeah, so this is the 7805 IC that we saw before. Now, let me just uh, give you how this IC is made or what is the internal, uh, what is going on inside this IC. On the left, you can see that that is the pinout of this IC. That is the functionality. You can see that uh, it has three pins. One is the output, the middle one is ground, and the first pin is an input. So that is pretty simple. And on the right side, you can see the block diagram. You can see the block diagram of this IC. So every IC uh, starts uh, as a block diagram. So we call this as abstraction. So every IC starts as an idea and that idea is uh, expressed as a block diagram. So if you see here, you can see that there is a starting circuit. There is a reference voltage and a lot of different uh, components here. So this is this can be seen as the uh, as the functional representation of what's going on inside the IC. So remember the term IP, intellectual property. So each of these can be considered as an IP. 
Understood? Right. So the starting circuit is one IV. The current generator is another IV. The reference voltage section of the circuit is another IP. So each of these can be considered as an IP or a subsystem. The terminologies can vary. So this is basically the functional representation. Now let's go into one more layer, one more layer down. That is the actual logical representation of this IC. So uh, let's, yeah. So you can see this is the actual logic which is inside this IC. So you can see the red one, that's a, that's a transistor. The violet one, that is a, uh, that is a diode. The, then you can see the blue is a capacitor. The green circle shows a resistor. And you can see it is a combination of all these circuit elements. So almost all ICs in the world is a combination of all these elements. You have transistors, you have resistors, you have capacitors, you have diodes, and then you have some specialized devices, which I'm not going into. So this is, again, this is the logical representation of a 7805 IC. So this is for our understanding. This is for, uh, this is for us to understand how it works. So looking at this diagram, I can say that, okay, when I give an input voltage, so it first goes to the transistor Q17, if it is, uh, if the transistor Q17 turns on, then current will flow through R11 into uh, out. So I can understand how this IC works by looking at this logical representation. But this logical representation, you can consider it as the circuit diagram of the IC. But this is not what is actually going into uh, a silicon or a semiconductor. So I'll just show you uh, a picture of the actual semiconductor die. Remember die that I told about, that is each individual semiconductor layer or each individual semiconductor device without the packaging. So if you open up a 7805, then in the silicon part, you can see this. So this is how the, uh, the logical diagram that we saw before, this is how each of those trans transistors and resistors and capacitors are actually transferred onto uh, a piece of semiconductor. Okay. So, and that process is actually, we call it as physical design, which I'll explain uh, a little bit later. Now, uh, after this, so this is a very, uh, the, what we discussed was a very simple IC. Now let's look at something a little bit more complex, something like an SOC. So this is a, a representation of an arm-based SOC. So if you look at it in the middle, you can see that there is an arm core. The, that is the main process. Then you can see op amps. You can see various IOs. If you look at the uh, uh, rightmost green things, you can see that uh, there is UART, there is SPI, there is I2C. These are all uh, various IO things. Then if you look down in that red, uh, that red block that is called as CAN. That is again another uh, IO protocol. IO means input output. It's input output protocol. So uh, then you have a power management section. Then you have ADC, analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters. You have RAM. So all these elements come together to make an SOC. And each of these elements can be considered as a subsystem or each of these elements can be considered as a IP. So I hope I am clear till this point, like uh, you got a brief understanding about how a semiconductor uh, device is made or what are the internal components of a IC. Any doubts here before we move on to the next section? Okay, I don't think so. Okay, good. So. Now let's move on to how an IC is made. Now we saw what all constitutes an IC. Now let's move on to a very generic representation of how an IC is made. And of course, the majority of jobs, majority of the tech jobs at least uh, in this industry falls in one or multiple of these categories. So as I go along the 
the various steps of making an IC. I'll also explain about what are the types of jobs and what are the uh, basic skills uh, required for that type of jobs. Okay, so this is a very uh, very basic and a very generic uh, flow flow diagram of how an IC is made. So first we have. Hello, is there any questions? Okay. Yeah, so it all starts with an architecture and a specification. First, we need to choose what architecture are we building this on. Then we need to choose uh, the specification for that IC. So what are the components inside going to be? What are the voltage levels? What are the power levels? All these things. That is basically you are making the blueprint. You are making the plan for a IC. Then we move on to the next stage, which is functional design, where you actually design the various components of the IC and join everything together. After that comes functional testing, which where we actually test uh, the, the functionality of the IC. And parallel to that, there is something called as physical design, which is where, uh, as I showed before, the logic is actually translated into the silicon layer or it is prepared for being manufactured into uh, a semiconductor wafer okay so after a lot of these then we have manufacturing then uh, after manufacturing we have one more level of testing Ma after manufacturing we don't just uh, simply ship it off into the market we need to do more testing on manufactured pieces and make sure that Everything is bug free. There is no issues with our IC, with our design, and our IC is working the way it is expected to. And after that, only comes uh, production or mass production, we can say. And again, uh, there are two more things which happens parallel, which is software design. I'll, I'll touch up more on that uh, while going forward. So, the first one, it is architecture and specification. So, as I mentioned, this is where the uh, the idea of an IC is actually coming into it is it is being turned into the first level of uh, first level of functionality we can say. So the basic job roles here we can expect are so that it define the architecture and specification for new product. So as if you are an architect in a company, then it is your role to understand what is needed in the industry, and it is your role to come up with the new architecture a new product itself so uh, the uh, for to say an example 10 years back the industry didn't have much uh, role in terms of ai artificial intelligence but if you look at the current industry there is lots and lots of ai applications out so when this ai applications started increasing many companies saw an opportunity there and they built semiconductor ICs. They built specific accelerator chips to aid in the process of AI. So basically, this particular role is like that. You need to think into the future, and you need to define new products, and you need to define uh, the, the specification for whatever your company is going to manufacture next. Also, it involves uh, research and development into new architectures, into new instruction set architectures and modification of existing ones, all those things. So basically, this is a uh, this is one job role which needs a lot of experience. This is not for a fresher. So it needs very in-depth knowledge of uh, analog and digital electronics and in systems and uh, manufacturing. So almost you need to be an encyclopedia in terms of uh semiconductor manufacturing and design and all so that it's a very high level role and it is a let me tell you it is a very coveted job if you are an architect in a semiconductor industry that means you are uh, among the top paid and you are among the top respected in that industry but again this is a, a requires a great deal of experience i just mentioned it for the sake of understanding so Next onwards, we can see that uh, there are job roles which a fresher can uh, target and then a fresher can get into. So the this job role is functional design. So as you see, once the architecture is specified, then that architecture needs to be designed. 
if you remember the yes any questions okay so once an architecture is defined uh, let's take the example of the 7805 the architecture is where the block diagram is uh, made so we have uh, the current section, we have the voltage comparison section, all these things are made. So uh, they say that, okay, I want this, I want uh, this section to be connected to this section like that. So that architecture, the specification is made. Now comes the actual building of this. So we need to build this out. So uh, just like we saw in that circuit diagram, after the architecture is made, you need to build that architecture using transistors, resistors, logic gates, all those things. So that is this particular stage. So uh, what are the job roles here? It is very uh, intuitive. It is the design of so the, the various functional blocks. Uh, if you remember the concept of IPs, uh, today's integrated circuits are not just one thing. It it involves a lot of subsystems coming together and talking to each other. A typical example would be, like I mentioned, uh, in a SOC, in a mobile SOC, you have cores which do the processing. You have memory controllers which interface with the RAM. Then uh, you have IO devices like uh, UART and I2C or uh, PCIe, USB. You have all these IO protocols. Then another thing would be you will have onboard storage. Then you will have, uh, so uh, right now some uh, SOCs are coming which have dedicated course for uh, artificial intelligence processing, then dedicated course for graphics or media. So it can have a lot of components like this. So each of these needs to be designed. Uh, so that is the role of a functional designer. Uh, it can involve everything from IPs or SOC, analog ICs, etc. Another, uh, so some of the basic skills that you would require in this, if you want to go into this particular job role is that good knowledge of analog and digital electronics, which I think is necessary. It, it's a necessity for all the job roles that I'm going to describe today. You need to have a very good knowledge of analog and digital electronics. And you need to have a good knowledge of HDL language. So like Perilog, System Perilog. So these are the HDL languages that are used to define, used to design these various components. So there, as I already mentioned, uh, you can say, you can, uh, you can, like you define registers in C++. You can, uh, I'm sorry, not registers. Uh, like you define a variable in C++, you can define a register in Verilog or VHDL. So uh, a register is basically a memory element, like it can be an 8-bit register, 16-bit register, or you can define a logic gate. I can say that, okay, I want an AND gate. I can define that and I can uh, give the connections of uh, two different. So the inputs I can connect to one or zero and output I can connected to another gate or another register. So like this, there are, it's, a, it's a lot more complex than what I just mentioned. But uh, basically just understand that HDL languages are a must for uh, a designer role. And uh, that's basically how we design an IP. Uh, then you need to understand the basic design methodologies. You need to understand how a register is made. You need to understand how uh, a comparator is made. You need to understand how an op-amp is made. Like, likewise, you need to understand uh, how clock can be given to various these things. You need to uh, understand how a flip-flop can be made from transistors. So likewise, you need to understand the basic uh, design methodologies. Uh, yeah, so that's basically some of the skills and it is a plus if you understand EDA tools. As I already mentioned, these EDA tools are mostly given by the support companies and understanding them is uh, really good. But which EDA tool you use depend on which company that you are working in. So this is uh, more of something that you can pick it up. But a basic understanding of at least one of the EDA design tool is uh, it will be really good. So that's about the functional design. 
Now let's go to the next part, which is software design. So you might be wondering what does software have to do in a predominantly hardware world? But what you need to understand is that no hardware, no chip can function on its own. Uh, I mean, let me rephrase myself. There are certain chips which can function on its own. I'm mostly talking about SOCs, microcontrollers, the, those complex chips. They cannot function on their own. They need uh, the uh, they need the presence of softwares like BIOS or firmware or uh, embedded OS, embedded operating systems for their work. So without these uh, components, it cannot work. So if you uh, if you uh, look at your laptop, if you look at your computer or your, your desktop, you can see that the moment you press a button, the on button, what comes into picture is the BIOS. The BIOS is uh, bringing your, uh, your CPU out of reset. It is uh, initializing all the inputs and outputs. It is initializing the display and all those things. Another example, uh, another example of maybe firmware that I can give is uh, all of you would have at least uh, tried to uh, change the settings of your TV or your uh, computer screen. So there comes uh, a box with options like increase brightness, decrease brightness. So, so you can say that that functionality is actually provided by the embedded firmware within that device. So basically firmware, uh, firmware, BIOS and embedded OS, all these things are at the interface between the actual uh, hardware that is the IC and the system software or the application software, which is trying to run on the IC. So it acts as a middleman. So a system software may not be able to uh, run directly on an IC. It needs some uh, something like a firmware to act as a middleman. Okay, so uh, I hope that is clear. So all uh, semiconductor industries have a very great software presence also because if they don't provide software, whether it be application software or whether it be uh, the lower level software like BIOS, firmware and all, all, none of their products will be useful, especially companies like Intel who, who manufacture CPUs or uh, Nvidia which manufacture graphics. So all their products will work only when there is a compatible software. So they have a large set of software professionals also in this industry and software is a very important part. Okay. So here I'm just talking about the, uh, the lower level software, but there are, uh, I just want you to understand that there are conventional software developers also in a large number in all these companies. So basic uh, job role is to design of uh, designing of software elements and uh, the skills, the fundamental skills that you need to have are as follows. So you need to have a good understanding of the electronics. You need to understand both hardware and software, how and how these two interact together. Of course, you need to understand uh, one of the programming languages. You might need to understand even assembly language. Some uh, firmware is actually coded in assembly language. So you might need to understand that, but that again depends on the company and the job the role that you are in. And of course, you need to understand about the compilers, the ID, ID is uh, integrated development environments. So, uh, uh, so what that is, is it's an environment like, um, if I want to give an example, uh, Eclipse, that is an ID for uh, where you can uh, mainly used in Java program. So those things like that. Uh, so basically you need to have a good grasp on software as well as how this software interacts with the hardware to be in this type of a job role. Now, another important thing, uh, yes, as Sir mentioned, Keel. Keel is a ID for uh, hardware. So uh, I remember using uh, Keel for running uh, 8086, 8085 and all back in college. Yeah, so that's basically what an IDE is. Now, the next function is uh, functional testing. Uh, so what happens in this stage, what happens in this stage of a design process of an IC is that you are designing the functionality 
of the IC. We are designing if the IC is working as expected. So let's take the 7805 itself. So 7805 has just two uh, inputs and one output. So that cannot be tested until uh, the, the, we get an actual uh, thing in our hand. But at this stage, we don't have the manufactured device in our hand. So what we do, what we do in the industry is that we have majorly two methods. So we have two methods and uh, so that is one thing is simulation and the second thing is emulation. Let me just give you a quick ex uh, explanation of that. So simulation is when you have the design or uh, if you remember, I mentioned about RTL. So uh, functional design will give the design as a RTL. So that will have lots and lots lines of code. Uh, so it will have all the definitions, all the functions, all the gates, all the transistors defined. So that is RTL code. Uh, which is in a system Verilog or Verilog or VHDL, depending on the language. So that RTL code can be uh, fully run in simulation. To give you an example, uh, I think many of you would have uh, did some kind of simulation, circuit simulation, at least the circuit branches would have tried some kind of circuit simulation. Say, for example, I have a five volt battery, I have a switch and I have an LED. I can connect them in a simulation software like MATLAB or PSPICE or Proteus. And I can uh, simulate, I can basically uh, mimic how it will behave in the real world in software. So that is the idea of simulation. And how we are able to do is because we can predict the output of all these elements, all these gates, all these logic gates and registers and all these uh, behavior it is known to us. So uh, whenever I give uh, an input as one in, uh, in the input of an AND gate, a two input AND gate, I give one as the input to one of those two inputs. So we know that it will always give an output of one, right? I mean, it will always give an output based on the second input. If the second input is one, the output will be one. The second input is zero, the output will be zero. Likewise, we know the behavior of NOT gate, uh, XOR gates, and all these elements. We know the behavior of uh, transistors and resistors and capacitors. When uh, a voltage is given, how will a transistor behave? When a current flows through a resistor, how it will behave? So we know that. I mean, we it is these kind of characterization is already known to us. And therefore, we can test our design completely in software that is referred to as simulation. But simulation is a very slow process. Uh, to give you an understanding of that, if I want to, so the product that I'm working on, I'm, uh, what I'm working on is, uh, you can consider it as an SOC. So to simulate one second of real world application. So, uh, so to simulate one second of uh, processing of that SOC in simulation, in software, it will take me more than 24 hours. So we have uh, special tools and software to do the simulation. So it will, if I start a test now, it will take more than 24 hours to calculate all the, all the different stages and everything and give me a result. And that is because I work on a very com I work on a very complex IC. So if it is a simple IC like a comparator or if it is a simple IC uh, which has uh, very few uh, gates and transistors, simulation will be much faster. But that is one major disadvantage of simulation that it is very slow process because it is entirely done in software. So why do we go for hardware uh, implementation of these things in the first place? To make it as fast as possible, right? So uh, when we try to simulate that, the hardware part in software, it is very slow. And that is uh, one trade-off that we have to do. But this is a very important piece of testing. And major testing of functionality happens in this uh, simulator. Uh, because even though it takes so much time, it is very essential that we find bugs in simulation 
because it is very much expensive to uh, rectify a bug once the chip goes into production so somehow or the other we need to find majority of the bugs or uh, in fact all of the bugs in the simulation and emulation so emulation is again uh, it's it's more of a hybrid between pure software testing and pure hardware test so if you remember i mentioned about fpgas and i mentioned that fpgas are a bunch of gates which i can program like i wish so what we do is we create a programmable model of our design and then we load it into an fpga and uh, when we load it into an fpga we can test it with more speed and we can we can get a uh, a basic idea or you can get a very crude idea of how the final hardware is going to function because uh, fpga is basically hardware so that is uh, uh, that is what what is called in the, in the industry as emulation so this simulation and emulation happens in parallel emulation uh, has its own merits and demerits which i am not going into so basically functional testing means uh, uh, doing the testing in uh, either in simulation or emulation and also uh, there is uh, there is a category of jobs where you are developing the infrastructure we call it as test bench for simulation to happen or emulation to happen first the simulator or the emulator needs to be set up it needs to be developed so that kind of jobs also come in this category again the skills required remains kind of the same but here uh, you would uh, need to understand uh, you need uh, one very key skill of a tester is that uh, you need to know the design you need to know the design inside and out so that you can test it in all possible scenarios so i hope that is clear let's move on so we are running out of time okay so next is something called as physical design so physical design as i already mentioned this is where the actual uh, the logical design the gates and transistors are actually made into uh, they are made into a format which can be sent to the manufacturing facility so that's physical design it has a lot of uh, sub uh, it has a lot of sub uh, categories which i am not going to explain so basically you can consider it as uh, building a pcb for our uh, for our design so when you have a circuit diagram you can uh, format it in very good uh, uh, you can format it just like a a square or a rectangle but uh, when you are actually making it into a pcb you cannot do like that you need to route wires in different ways uh, you need to uh, connect uh, you need to have through hole things you need to connect between different layers of the pcb all these things are there so likewise when a uh, when a semiconductor device is actually manufactured so it is manufactured uh, in a different way than we saw uh, in the logical diagram so first uh, the individual ips are uh, they are placed in the die uh, or in that piece of silicon or that piece of semiconductor first these various devices are placed then they are they are, the connections between them are routed together and a lot of uh, tasks happen like that so i'm not going into much so this is basically that kind of roles so uh, the basic job roles are uh, making that physical layout and all the related things um, i'm not going into details and uh, then another important job is to create the mask so once this physical design is done what you mainly have as an output is there is going to be a mask so there is going to be a design file and then there is going to be a mask file so basically what this mask does is that uh, this this is the uh, this is the template this is the template which is used by the machine by the actual machine which prints the design onto a silicon material okay so we don't have time to explain you can just uh, go and do a search of what a semiconductor mask is so again you need to uh, you need to have fundamental knowledge of analog and digital electronics and all these things 
And uh, here you need uh, very good knowledge of uh, the core VLSI principles because there are a lot of design uh, rules. There are a lot of rules for uh, routing. There are a lot of rules. So a very basic one is that you need to keep the input output devices or whatever devices the pins has to go out, you need to keep on the edge of the, uh, on the silicon uh, die. Uh, another uh, basic rule you can say is that uh, heat dissipating elements like uh, heat dissipating elements like core and processors, they need to have sufficient area to uh, dispense the heat. So there are a lot of rules. There are uh, these form the core of uh, VLSI concepts. So here you need to understand a little bit about uh, the physics uh, behind it, and you need to understand the various rules. So what I uh, what is mentioned is what is mentioned as DRA is design rule, uh, basically the design rules. So all those things, and definitely here this is one job area where you need to have a really good understanding of the EDA tools. So there are specific tools which does the physical design or the routing. There are spec specific tools for floor plan. There are specific tools for routing. All these things are there. So you need to understand that. Uh, so that's basically about physical design. Now let's come to software design, software testing. I'm not going much detail into this. This is almost the same as functional testing, but this time you're testing the software rather than the uh, actual hardware. So you can just see, you need to know the underlying electronics. That is, that is essential in all these job roles. It is essential for everything. Then as a software tester, you need to understand. So we are talking about manufacturing. So when you talk about manufacturing, this is one area which in, from an India's perspective, this is lacking. So manufacturing, I don't know. Hello, am I still audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Audible, okay. sir. Okay, so manufacturing, uh, it's virtually non-present in India. There is no commercial fabs in India. Uh, only fabs that I know about are uh, in ISRO or DRDO. And there are some fabs in institutes like IITs and IISC. So there is no commercial fabs. It's all in different countries. It's not in India. So manufacturing is one job role which you cannot expect in India. So uh, the various job roles in manufacturing uh, are very vast. It involves everything from the factory to the actual manufacturing, then packaging. So, and then there is quality control. That is what QC, then management of all these fabs. So there are a lot of things and there are job roles in research and development. So manufacturing is a very key thing. When I say manufacturing, I'm talking about the seven nanometer, the five nanometer, the 10 nanometer that we are talking about. So there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of R&D uh, possibilities there. But as I mentioned, uh, in India, this field is not there. So here you need to understand very good VLSI and the related physics. And then you need to understand the material sciences all those things and of course, various tech and tools which are used in this particular field. Uh, so I don't want to go into more details. Um, even I'm not very much aware of the manufacturing sector. So next thing is post-silicon. Post-silicon is when uh, post-silicon testing is happens when we uh, actually get the chip, when we get the chip uh, in our hand. So uh, those samples are called as test chips. Hello, I am getting some disturbance. Am I still audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, audible. Uh, is my video very Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Any kind of problem? Okay, no problem. If I go muted or something, please let me know. Okay, so post silicon testing is when we actually take uh, the engineering samples, we call them. So we take them and then we test the complete chip. So end to end testing, all the functionalities, the, all the software, hardware, all these testing is done. Okay, so that's about post silicon testing. 
and uh, related to post silicon testing it's basically uh, the same as functional testing only thing is that you are now testing with the actual uh, product uh, so the skills required again almost the same things uh, that you need for as a functional tester so here you might need more understanding of uh, object oriented programming or scripting languages like python because most of the test infrastructure will be based on that so that's the whole uh, picture i would say that's that's the that's how uh, that's how a very generic ic i would say is defined but based on which ic that we are manufacturing whether it is a complex soc or a simple analog ic the various steps in this can change also one more thing i want to uh, uh, want to make very clear is why i showed a reverse arrow from functional testing back to functional design that is because it is an iterative process even post silicon testing is an iterative process when we do functional testing we do the testing we find a bug we find an issue then we report it out to the designers and then they will fix it so basically it's a it's a cycle so we find an issue we will fix it in the next revision uh, so we find another issue then they will fix it in the uh, uh, the next revision like that it goes and these cycles continue until the we reach a point where okay we are uh, fairly certain that okay now uh, we have good quality and we don't have much bugs so when we reach that stage only we'll send it for the first level of manufacturing okay so there are one category of jobs which i didn't mention in this because uh, it lies outside the uh, the design uh, cycle uh so this is uh, it, with respect to the support uh, industry the support uh, companies that i mentioned about so basically the main job here is you develop uh, the tools you develop the software with which we uh, design and we do this testing we do this emulation simulation or silicon testing all these uh, are done using uh, the software which is given by these supports so here what you basically need to know is that you need to know application level program application programming you need to know and then again you need to know the uh, so you need to know what where your uh, software is going to how your eda tool is going to be used otherwise you cannot make uh, in any eda tool so a good knowledge of the hdl languages uh, about compilers and how the software is actually going to mimic the hardware all those knowledge is required okay uh, so that's about that now uh, let me come to a very uh, uh, important thing or i can say some tips some uh, pointers that i i can give regarding starting your career so whatever i just mentioned till now are the various job roles that is available in this industry and uh, it is not necessary that you should know everything every skill that i mentioned and as a student as a fresher it is very much possible that you don't know many of these things. so that is okay as a fresher no one expects you to know all these things i just gave you a uh, i just gave you a brief of what the industry demands from you so that you can develop your own skills or whatever you can so uh, when you talk about starting a career the most uh, uh, easy way or the most uh, common way that we have is placements but uh, what i've seen is that these type of companies especially the corporate the big corporations they go and hire from uh, the top institutes in the country uh, uh, and of course there are other companies which uh, do hiring so if you can get as a placement then that is very good but this is uh, this is a slim chance i would say compared to uh, an it company or a software company this is a, a little bit slim chance now another uh, important thing is that you can apply to these companies directly and uh, i would say that more than that it is better if you have a referral so if you have a contact in that company if you know someone in that company that person can refer for you and that will have a much more chance of uh, getting you an interview than you applying directly but of course you can apply directly to these companies you can send them their resumes 
uh, or you can uh, you can just go to their website all most of the companies they have a, in their websites they have a place where uh, they mention about the careers even if uh, a post is not open some companies even allow you to just simply submit your resume with their system so that if something comes up then uh, they can come back to you so you can obviously do that now another uh, very important uh, part especially in this industry that i've seen is that is internships so uh, personally i got into this industry through internship so i did a one year internship at intel and after that i joined there i got the opportunity to join there as a permanent employee so internship is uh, a great way so uh, many of these companies especially the corporate the big corporates they have internship programs which you can uh, which you can uh, apply to and uh, being a student this is a more uh, good way i would say being a fresher this is this could be a, a really good way and of course there is a, you can do specialization courses or mtech in vlsi and embedded systems you can do very there are specialization courses related to vlsi design and vlsi testing physical design all these things are there so you can try those things uh now i know that we have uh, gone very much over time but uh, these are some uh, useful tips that uh, i i can give you so we are coming to the end of our presentation so uh, be very strong in your fundamental knowledge that is digital electronics analog electronics vlsi uh, concepts uh, be very strong in that then try to gain practical knowledge as i mentioned may, uh, these eda tools there, there are many tools which are available and which you can go and just uh, just mess around in that tool you can just go around and you can just uh, try to do some try to build a gate try to build a comparator try to build a, a small mux or uh, or try to build something like that just gain some practical knowledge and if possible try to do a project at least till the simulation level if you do a project if you have that practical knowledge when you apply to a company it will give you that much more boost take it from me so uh, another thing is that you should try to understand what the industry demands a very good way for this is to go to that industry's website check what are the requirements check their career website you can see that uh, in most of the job uh, requests they will put what are the skills you require what are they looking for they will say that okay fundamental knowledge of very low uh, knowledge in uh, digital systems companies will say like that so you can go and check for uh, these things so that you will get an understanding of what the industry is expecting then of course uh, last thing i want to say is that network with professionals and recruiters you should uh, you should follow them uh, in linkedin and you should try to network with them so that you will get more exposure in this industry and of course as i mentioned before you can get referrals also from professionals and then there are a lot of recruiters there are a lot, lot of recruiters which recruit to this particular industry if you check in linkedin then you can see many of them so try to follow them try to network with them and they can also help you to uh, land a job in this particular industry uh, just want to give you a few companies uh, working in this space in kerala these are some of the companies that i was able to find from my friends and colleagues and all so these are mostly the the uh, these are mostly working in the service sector so they uh, they don't usually have their own products but they uh, design and develop and test products for other customers so better you can also go and google and you can search for uh, on your own so uh, that would be good so just keep these companies in mind i'm not endorsing any of these companies i don't know about what kind of work they do or what uh, how that company culture is or anything so i am not endorsing any of these companies just that these are some of the companies who have offices in kerala and who work in this particular industry uh, if you really want to get into this industry then the best place i would say is bangalore bangalore there are tons of companies in this space just go to google and search for semiconductor industries in bangalore and you can get tons and tons of uh, uh, results 
so if you really are interested in pursuing a career then uh, you should probably look at that also one parting word one parting uh, advice i know that it's been a long session i had lot of material to cover so i apologize to all of you and uh, i thank you all for sticking till now just one this is what i want to leave you all with so as a student your best uh, skill that you can have is your enthusiasm to learn so that is the best asset that you have so you when you are uh, going into the industry as a fresher you might not know much but you should have an enthusiasm to learn you should l- try to grasp as much as possible and show that you are ready to learn and show that you can learn and that would mean the difference between uh, you getting uh, you being a successful in your career or not so this is what i want to leave you with uh, thank you all uh, thank you to amal jyoti Col- uh, amal jyoti college of engineering and the student branch there for inviting me today so all of you stay safe uh, it's a difficult time all of you stay safe and uh, if you have any questions you can find me in linkedin in uh, in twitter and in instagram everywhere i am ronnie alex thomas you can drop me a message uh, or a mail uh, at ronnie alex thomas at gmail.com so you, i usually respond within a day uh, just one request don't uh, please don't uh, try to connect with me in facebook i am very uh, dormant there any of the, any of these other platforms uh, i am mostly active so you can catch me in any of these platforms so yeah let's uh, wind up uh, with that i once again i want to apologize for taking so much time and i hope that uh, you were able to get some sort of info regarding the uh, the semiconductor industry the vlsi industry and i hope to see at least some of you in this industry in future and whatever help you need whatever doubts you have always feel free i am a very much approachable person so that's it from my side thank you thank you very much and uh, thank you all for joining <laughs>